On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, we've got global supply chain issues. We've got backlogs of ships at major ports. But have no worry, the government is here to give you ship advice. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. I'm the chair of the Department of History, Criminal Justice, and Political Science, and whatever else they want to throw at me, at Campbell University. I'm a former merchant mariner, and I teach courses in maritime industry policy, maritime history, and maritime security. Okay, a lot going on this past couple of days. I mean, literally one, two days. A lot happened, and we've got four major issues involving the government I want to go over here real quick and, and, and deal with, because there is a lot going on with shipping right now. So any good follower of this YouTube channel knows, and please, if you're not a follower, please subscribe, hit the bell to be alerted about new videos when they come out. But any follower of this knows this is marine traffic, and this is the anchorage off LA Long Beach. And I say anchorage because it's not just an anchorage. There's the drift zone off here, off Santa Catalina Island. Vessels just aimlessly drifting around. Come in here. These are the big anchorages right here uh, off LA and Long Beach. Uh, pipeline runs right through here. This is where we saw that pipeline get hit and drag and uh, the oil spill happen. And then right in here are the twin ports of LA on the left and Long Beach on the right. Now, we have seen some interesting proposals come out from members of Congress recently regarding this situation. And I'll give you two of them. And to be completely fair, I do it from both sides of the spectrum here. I do not have a political bias in any way. So the first one here is by Representative Madison Cawthorn, who's from North Carolina, by the way. He's not my congressman, but he is from North Carolina. In October 1st, he wrote this, seeing lots of reports about cargo ships being held in holding patterns off our coast. Are these manufactured crises going to start looking into this and we'll update soon? He has updated uh, afterwards. Uh, but I have to say that type of kind of conspiratorial ideas is, is not good. This has been going on for a long time, understand. We've started seeing these backlogs happen at the fall of 2020. They have continued throughout. They have, they have overlapped the Trump and Biden administration. You can go back into 2015, six, uh, 2015 and see this happen again with labor strikes. It doesn't do any good to get uh, kind of conspiratorial here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, what we're seeing here is happening because a whole series of issues and events that I talked about in a video that, that broke all this down in a series of steps. If you want to break down on how that happens, how we got to the situation we're in today, I, I have a five-step video where I talk about the maritime aspect, where I break down kind of the, really the maritime issues that got us to where we are. It's, it's not a conspiracy. The second one, and on the other side of the spectrum of the political side, is this, Representative uh, Michelle Steele. Today, I introduced legislation to ban cargo ships off the Orange County coast. Ship anchored for weeks and months off our coast likely caused last week's oil spill. Reports show that the pipe may have been struck several other times by ship's anchors off the coast. She goes on down here. The Ship Act would ban cargo ships from idling or anchoring in the coastal waters of Southern California for the next 180 days. It's time to get the ports working again and get these ships moving and out of our waters. Uh, I, number one, I talked about this. I talked about what the cause is. Uh, and again, went in some detail about ship dragging anchors across this. If Representative Steele has an issue, her ship act will not do it. I think it's misappropriately named. It's, 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 it has nothing to do with ships. It sounds like ship, but it's not ships. Uh, all this is going to do is push those ships off into the anchorage, uh, out of the anchorages here and off into the Santa Barbara Channel drifting around. Number one, that creates more problems because if you want more pollution, have the ships running their engines all the time underway. And more importantly, let's put bumper boats off the coast of Southern California because nothing could ever go wrong with this. This solution right here is looking at the wrong thing. If she wants to pass a bill, I am happy to help her pass a bill. Let's pass the Vessel Traffic Service Act that puts more control and oversight over ships within U.S. coastal waters through FAA-like air traffic control systems, but for ships. And this way, when high weather comes in and a ship potentially drags its anchor across a pipeline, there'll be a VTS system that can sit there and say, hey, ship, get underway and get away from the anchorage, or better yet, see it happen, get investigators out there to investigate that a pipeline has been moved forth 150 feet, 4,000 foot length of it, and survey it before it cracks and leaks. If you want to do good legislation, there's good legislation to be had. 
this is not good legislation. Neither is Representative Cawthorn's uh, hyper, hyperbolic speech about this. So I think both of them really need to just realize if you want to help and there's there's elements that can be done to help, this is not one of them. All right. The next one here has to do with the logistics supply situation. And I posted this video the other day. Can global shipping save Christmas? Yes, I know Christmas is more than just giving. I, I, I got a few notes about that. I understand. I'm talking about the commercial aspect, but more importantly, the supply aspect. Can we get in here and save it? And we've seen a couple of stories about this come out. So this first one from G Captain is Mike Schuller's report on the White House uh, uh, plans uh, to address the supply chain bottleneck at the ports of LA and Long Beach. Now, what we saw was a concentrated rollout here by the Biden administration to address the port situation. He brought in the heads of the port of LA and uh, Long Beach into Washington, D.C., and they unloaded this entire plan here. And the big key thing that they're talking about here was opening 24 7 gate operations at LA. Long Beach had already done so for one terminal, one out of six, and now they were pushing this for LA. Follow-up story right here in G Captain, also from Reuters, supply chain too snarled for Biden's Christmas fix, experts say. So here's this element right here. Here's this, you know, hey, Biden comes out and promises this big, huge fix. Understand, it is a supply chain. If you fix one link that has a kink into it, you need to make sure the rest of the chain is straight and there has to be no kinks in it. it it's like a series of valves in a pipe. If, if, if some of those valves are gated down or shut down completely, it doesn't do any good to open up one valve because it's just going to run into the blockage of the next one. And that's what this is doing. And again, if you don't believe me, I give you two firsthand accounts about this. One is this story on freight waves by Lorianne LaRocca. I absolutely will read everything Lorianne does. I think she's fantastic what she does. She's got great books too. I got, again, you know, the historian to me, I love some good books. And Lorianne has done some great books on them. Hardly recommend when I do my next top 10 list of, of books to read, Lorianne's going to be up there on it. But right here, the truth behind the 24 7 port operations pledge, the 90 day sprint will be a slow walk if key players aren't on board. And one of the things she notes right from the very beginning is that 24 seven is not being done. Let me be clear what the Biden administration promised. And I have to say it was completely convoluted in what they promised. Someone had said it's going to be 3,500 containers till the end of the year. That's nothing. Then they said 3,500 containers a week. And then somebody said 3,500 containers a day. That's what they're going to move. What we do know is about 3,500 containers a week. That's what they're hoping to increase exporting out of the ports. That is a half a ship. Let me be clear. That's a half a ship. That is a drop in the bucket when you're dealing with 60 ships anchored off the port here or drifting around. Again, come back over here. A lot, a lot of vessels kind of steaming around there. More so if Representative Steele kicks them off and boots them out. But this story right here by Lorianne kind of goes in detail about that. She starts talking about it. Biden's announcement 24-7 is not accurate. Only one terminal out of 12 in San Pedro is operating 12 hours a day. Total terminals international at the port of Long Beach. And every second schedule is only Monday through Thursday, making it a 24 situation, not 24-7. I will go a second bit. One of the things that I love about my YouTube channel and my Twitter and everything else is I get notices from people on the ground, truck drivers, longshoremen. You name it, they are right there doing this. So here's a buddy of mine, Nathan Strang. And uh, Nate and I go back and forth on several issues. But right here, Nathan Strang works for Flexport. Very, very active on Twitter. Uh, but right here, no sign of 24-7 ops yet. Not a single truck spotted in any of the LA Long Beach terminals in-gate cameras before 6.30 a.m. today. Boom, there you go. There's your announcement. We had an announcement. We're going 24-7. You had the, the heads of the port there. Now, I should mention, too, the heads of the port don't run the ports. They're landlords. It is these terminal operators that run the ports. It's the Pacific Maritime Association. It is these terminal operators that run this. Where were they? That's who I'd want to see. I understand the, the cinematic of Gene Soroka from LA, and he's great. He's fantastic. He is, he is, he is the face of everything. But let me be clear, him and Mario Cadora over at Long Beach, they're great, but you need these terminal operators. They are the keys. And the other aspect you need is the end of the supply chain, the warehouse operators, everything. Understand, it's great to get more truck drivers, but that means getting DMV open. Uh, 
Port of LA, Long Beach have strict requirement for what trucks come in there. If your truck is not within a certain amount of years, if it's not admission compliant, everything can't come in. These truck drivers are being clocked on time. You know, they have a set hours they can run, yet they're spending a lot of their time sitting there waiting, burning clock hours, waiting to get on lines. And we need to do adjustments down at the road rail level, not just in the ports. It has to be fixed holistically, not just one element. The next element here. So we talked about government uh, in 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 uh, Congress. We talked about Biden's uh, issue, but there's another issue that I have been raising rally about. Me and John Conrad over at GCAM have been doing this all the time, and that is who's in charge of this maritime crisis? Who's in charge? Secretary Pete Buttigieg, he should be in charge. He's been on maternity leave. Congratulations, Pete. I'm so happy for you. Uh, it, it's great. Uh, I, I have a child. I know how important that is. Uh, but who's in charge? Uh, great to take maternity leave. Who'd you leave in charge? Because I got to tell you, of the four major administrations that do transportation, road, rail, aviation, and maritime, the only one that had a full-time administrator was aviation, FAA. And that's because that person was appointed in 2019 and is there for a five-year term. All the rest, road, rail, and maritime, have to be politically appointed. And all of them, every last one of them, were vacant. There were acting administrators, but no full-time administrators there. And I would think those four people would be your Secretary of Transportation Task Force on port crises. Yes, we have a port envoy. Fantastic, we have a port envoy. Absolutely fantastic. Ports are only one element here doesn't do any good to get the stuff out of the port if it's jammed up on the highways coming out of LA and Long Beach, but have no fear. The Biden administration, people in the administration have listened to me. I'm amazed. I am amazed. And we saw smoke come out of the chimney of the White, the White House, meaning that we have named a maritime administrator. Yes, buried in a list of announcements yesterday. Uh, there's the announcement. Ann Phillips, nominee for administrator of the United States Maritime Administration at the Department of Transportation. Fantastic. Who's Ann Phillips? I heard this name coming out. I wrote about this name quite a bit about. And who is she? Let's go down here and see. Now, again, one of the things we want is a maritime shipping crisis, somebody with a deep depth of experience in maritime shipping, logistics, transportation, you know, whole board. You need a, a lot of experience out there. And let me be clear, there are tons of people out there and tons of women out there. I can name half a dozen women off the top of my head. Right now, Ali Sedino over at Women Offshore, Jenna Carpenter at Inland Waterways. Uh, I can name, again, half a dozen women off the top of my head who were fairly qualified to do this. But let's look at Ann Phillips here. Her a position for a administer, a uh, merit administrator, leader in the field of coastal resilience and climate impact on national security at the regional, national, and international level. In her current appointment as the first special assistant to the governor of Virginia, for coastal adaption and protection, she's building collaborative whole of government and community approach to address the impact of coastal flooding along the Commonwealth, including the development of Virginia's first coastal resilience master plan. Okay, coastal planning, that's fantastic. I, uh, global warming is a major issue we're dealing with. I think this is very important. Uh, the maritime administrator is in charge of America's maritime seaways. It's in time of maritime transportation, maritime logistics. It is not really in charge of coastal management. This sounds like NOAA. This sounds like Department of Interior. This sounds like everything but. But perhaps she has a depth of experience that I'm missing. Let's go to the second paragraph. Prior to her current appointment, Ann Phillips served nearly 31 years on active duty in the U.S. Navy, retiring as a rear admiral, two-star admiral. Her final flag command was as commander, Expeditionary Strike Group 2, including 14 ships and 10 subordinate commands, all the amphibious expeditionary forces on the east coast of the U.S. Earlier, she served as the chief of naval operations staff as deputy director and then director of surface warfare. Division had the honor to command destroyer USS Mus Mustin, DDG-89, and a command destroyer squadron 28. I should also mention... She's a UNC, uh, University of North Carolina grad, go Tar Heels, uh, in literature and French language. Uh, I think she seems aptly qualified to be a naval commander, to an admiral. I'm sure she was fantastic in running amphibs. I'm sure she was fantastic in doing that. I see no commercial maritime experience there. And again, what does that mean? Do you need to be a commercial maritime person to be in charge? No. I mean, we've had admirals before who have been in charge of, of the maritime administration. Admiral Emery S. Land, who commanded the U.S. Maritime Commission through World War II, 
was not a commercial guy. He actually was the head of the U.S. shipbuilding during World War, uh, prior to World War II. So he was a shipping, uh, shipping board, uh, shipping bureau, excuse me, shipping bureau. Uh, uh, Admiral Cochran, who took the, f- the first leader of Maritime Commission, was a vice admiral in the U.S. Navy, but he had been under Admiral Land in the old Maritime Commission. Uh, we've seen other people. This is a list. Just I, I pulled this up of previous Marad commanders. Uh, Mark Busby, who's the most recent one, was a, a, a Kings Point Merchant Marine Academy grad, was in the U.S. Navy, commanded Military Sealift Command. He was on the board at Carnival for a while. Uh, Chip Jernigan had really no experience other than the fact he had served briefly as deputy administrator. David uh, Matsuda was a DOT attorney, was a, a staffer who was thrown in there. A lot of issues with, with uh, Matsuda when he was in. Sean Cunningham. Connington was a, a grad of, of Merchant Marine Academy, a Coast Guard guy. Schubert was probably the last one who had actually been a mariner on a ship, served as, as captain. Clyde Hart had been with the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission. Albert Her- Herberger had been vice uh, head of Transportation Command. He was a Merchant Marine uh, grad. Lee Beck was also a mariner, master mariner, really knew his, uh, his stuff. Uh, go back to Groudon, he was with the Coast Guard and DOT. And then Shear was with the Navy. Uh, there's no right formula here for this, but we're in the middle of the greatest maritime crisis we've, we've experienced since World War II. And I don't mean to knock Ann Phillips at all. She's probably a fantastic woman, and she may turn out to be the best maritime administrator we ever had. Uh, it's going to be a real question about who she brings in to fill out those ranks, because I have to say right from the beginning, looking at the transcript, looking at her CV, her resume, she does not come in with the qualifications that you would think right now you would want to oversee this situation. We're dealing with a declining merchant marine. The U.S. merchant marine is now 21st in the world, had been first. We're dealing with a flagging industrial base with the United States. We're dealing with a shipping crisis where the FMC, the Federal Maritime Commission, has basically wiped their hands of this and walked away from it based on that interview I heard with Daniel Moffey, the chairman of the FMC with Lloyd's List. And now we're asking someone who has almost no experience with the commercial industry. I mean, does she know the people at Maersk, at Matson, at APL, at all the major companies out there, at OSG, at Crowley, at the, Mer- at the Merchant Marine Academy, at the state maritime schools? Does she know them? Has she, has she been reading G-Captain? Has she been reading Trade Waves? Has she been reading Freight Waves? Has she been reading Splash 24-7? Has she been keeping up on this issue? I got it. She's great at coastal resource management, but this is not a coastal resource management issue right now. And so here we have this story from John Conrad, Biden appoints U.S. Maritime Administrator with zero ship experience during worst ship crisis in decades. Uh, If you want unbridled talk about what this view is, read John's piece. It is it is there in for all its glory. It's in there. And and he talks uh, with with no holds punch about the issue about pointing. Uh, Admiral Phillips. The other issue I, I also have with this is I, I have to say, even with Admiral Busby, when Admiral Busby is, and I've I've met Mark on many occasions, I know him and everything like that. I have a problem putting a rear admiral, a two-star admiral in, in charge of this. Because again, they're going to be subservient to the CNO, to, to, to other military people, because they're going to be f- going up against four stars on some issues with defense. And here they are, a two-star doing that. You know, have we had Admiral's in charge. Yeah. I mean, Admiral Benson was the head of the U.S. shipping board. He had been the first chief of naval operations. No one was going to challenge Benson for this. But here we have a two star admiral. And I just think that this mix is 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 going to be a problem. Now, I hope Admiral Phillips, upon confirmation, this is a Senate confirmable position, is asked what her plans are, what she thinks the scope of the maritime administration's role is, what her what she's doing. She cannot come into this 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 hearing and sit there and say, "Well, you know, I'm going to get on it and I'll learn. I'm a fast learner." We don't have time for fast learning. We are in this crisis. Understand, this shipping crisis is going to be going on for into 2022 or 2023, based on best report. She's going to have to deal with international shipping organizations, the IMO, you name it. It, There's a lot of entities and she has got to learn quickly on this. And getting somebody up to speed who knows nothing about this is going to be a challenge, especially when you're going to see what I expect to see, a wholesale emptying of Marad of key experience leaving 
uh, because either the appointment of the maritime ministry didn't go the way they want or just retirements, they're just going to leave. And Marriott already has this issue of being very stovepiped and not talking among themselves. Last story. This is the other issue that's going to be faced here by the incoming maritime administrator she's going to have to deal with, which is, again, a perfect reason to have the first female maritime administrator. But again, I can think of others who, who would be great for this. Maritime administration is dealing with this sexual harassment case at not just the Merchant Marine Academy, but across the entire maritime field. I go back to this story that uh, John Conrad wrote here, Rape at Sea, an open letter to the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, Midshipman X. There's follow-ups in here. U.S. lawmakers are pressing for action on Merchant Marine Academy sexual assault allegations. And we're seeing this across the mainstream media, too. I mean, I, I saw stories in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, you name it. It's out there. Again, I talked about this in early October when I ran this story. Nobody was talking about it, and I'm not taking credit at all for this. Let me be clear. It, it, this was an effort done by the likes of Ali Sedino over at Women Offshore and a few other people who pushed it. I just heard about it and put it out there. But we're seeing multiple stories out there. We even see Maersk uh, suspending five in this midshipman rape case. There's a lot out there with this. And this is an issue that needs to be done. My buddy, John Conrad, was over at the Connecticut Maritime Association. This is the leading conference in commercial shipping in the United States. And number one, it was poorly represented. I mean, uh, lowest attendance ever. None of the major shipping firms were there. The U.S. government wasn't there except for a brief talk by Lucinda Leslie, the acting maritime administrator. No presence by the Navy or very little by the Coast Guard even was there. But the issue that came out that I think is the most interesting is I've talked to many people who attended this conference, and I've heard this from multiple sources, is the Coast Guard has been directly addressed. It was a question and answer, which the Coast Guard refused to take questions, but it was pushed on them is what's the Coast Guard doing about this? And the most disturbing aspect that came out about this was the Coast Guard basically deferring action on board ships that basically they're saying they don't have the jurisdiction to go in and prosecute harassment and rape on board a vessel. Understand, under U.S. law, the Coast Guard has a right to board every vessel of the United States and enact its laws and enforce its laws. They want to defer that to the FBI because the FBI does this for cruise ships. The FBI has an agreement with cruise ship operators under foreign flags and port state control that they'll come on board, arrest people who are set, who are subjected to uh, uh, harassment or, or who execute harassment and rape. But lots of times all the FBI does is they arrest somebody on a, on a Bahamian flag vessel. The, the crew member is Ukrainian. They lock them up. They send them back to Ukraine for prosecution and the Ukrainians let him go. And he works on another ship, but he's not working on that cruise line anymore. U.S. Coast Guard has jurisdiction about it. I could pull up the case law and I could pull up the U.S. federal code that says this. The Coast Guard had better start acting on this. During the Vietnam War, when there was an issue with crews on board ships in Vietnam, the commander out there, the Navy commander, the, the Military Sea Transportation Service, later on Military Sea Com Command commander, had a Coast Guard captain come out and basically get control of the crews by threatening them, pulling their licenses, arresting them, and sending them home for trial because they couldn't be tried under the UCMMJ. So... This needs to be done. Five issues at play here, right? Or four issues at play right here, all of them involving the government. And I am not sure how this is going to roll out. It's going to be interesting to see. We've got, again, Congress wanting to take some issue, but they don't seem to know what they're doing. We've got the Biden administration announcement that we're going 24-7 operations in the port, but we're not. We've got appointment of a new maritime administrator who has no background at all in the commercial maritime industry. And then we have these allegations of rape and assault on board U.S. ships. And the agency that's supposed to be overseeing it, the U.S. Coast Guard, basically says, it's not us. So we're the government. We're here to help. Uh, it doesn't sound that way. All right. On that uh, well, I can't even talk. Sorry. Cheery bit of news. This is Sal. If you enjoyed this video, and, and again, I don't understand anybody enjoys these videos. I really don't because they're always depressing to me. But I think you need to know this stuff. Please subscribe to the channel. Take a moment. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. Give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment. Share it across the social media spe uh, spectrum. I've started a Patreon page. Uh, it's, it's over here, I think. Yeah, it's right here. I started a Patreon page. 
this allows me to devote more time to do the research, uh, to, to, to not have to do all the jobs that I need to do and, and really devote time to doing this because I think it's really important that we understand the commercial side of shipping, the business side of shipping, uh, the impact it has in national security, the impact it has in supply chain, all those aspects and to find out this really vital information. So until our next video and the next time I see you, which will be on Monday, where we'll do another recap of the past week. We'll hit the top five stories on what the ship is going on. I'm also going to put together a talk I gave recently. I had two talks I gave recently. I'm going to put those together, pop them out probably over a weekend. So you have some historical talk. I am a historian. I do some, I do some history, believe it or not. So I'm going to get those out there for you. Until our next video, Sal, sign off.